Um, and, you know, for those of us who follow Christ, I think there's something that we all have in common, and that is that uh, we've all come through a season in our lives where we fully expected that God would act in one way, and He just didn't. And maybe, you know, we were really praying about something and, and asked Him to act in, in, in a mighty way, in some way, and it, and it just didn't happen. And in those seasons, we're left, I think, with this question. What do, what do I do when God doesn't do what I think He should do? What do I do when God doesn't do what I think He should do? You know, we've all either asked that question directly or we've thought about it in some way. And we've all been there, or, or maybe we're there now. And, we've, we've, uh, and, and if you're not there now, you're certainly probably going to be there in the future in situations in your life where God just doesn't act in a way that you think He should. And the reason we end up in this place is that we truly have some assumptions about God that we bring with us. I can remember sitting in a theology class, and my, our theolo theology professor came in, and he began the class with a statement. He, he wanted us to have a conversation around this topic, and he said this. He said, no matter who you are or where you have come from, we all approach God with a set of presuppositions. In other words, pre meaning in advance and suppose, meaning that you assume without having all the facts. And so you have presuppositions about God. And we place these things on God. We, our presuppositions we bring, and, and we expect God to meet those. And there are times when God acts outside of our assumptions or our presuppositions and, and, and acts independently of our mindset or our thinking. And when that happens, we kind of get confused and we begin to, to think that, that, uh, that God seems indifferent, maybe, or uncooperative, or that God's late or God's unfair in some way. And the questions come up in our mind. These questions roll over and over in our minds. God, do you even care? God, why won't you help? God, why haven't you shown up? And, and God... This just isn't fair. And when we get to this point, we think that we're the only ones that this has happened to. And I can take some ownership for that, I think, as a pastor, because many times pastors just make it sound too easy. Because there are phrases that pastors and even other Christians say that, that calls, our, calls to question our faith in those situations, and, and when we begin to have these thoughts, we, uh, you know, there, it, it, these, these statements that can be made or calls the question whether we have enough faith or not. And there are times when we make our issues seem huge, when there are others around us who are suffering through some really, really hard times, and you know, we get so focused on our lost car keys or our spilt coffee uh, on our way to work, and we totally miss that there are those around us that are having huge difficulties and need assurance of some type. And there are even some who completely walk away from God because someone made it sound so easy. But they've never gone through the difficulty that that person has gone through. You know, I'm excited about these next four weeks because what we're going to do is we're going to look at four individuals in Scripture that many would consider heroes of the faith. And we're going to see that their experience is not that much different from our own when it comes to, to God's participation in the activity of their lives. Uh, they, they too thought that God was indifferent. They too thought that God was uncooperative, that God was late, that God was unfair. You see, I believe that this Bible holds God's truth. What about you? And so when I, when I experience a time when I begin to question God's activity, I want to look at the place where God has chosen to reveal Himself in a very real way and, I, and ask a question. When I come to Scripture, many times I come to Scripture with questions. And the question that I bring in this case, when I'm feeling that God is indifferent, 
is, has anyone in Scripture experienced something like this? Maybe not the exact same scenario, but maybe they were experiencing these feelings that I have toward God. And when we see others who have endured a similar, a similar event or feeling and persevered, then we can know that, that in our own personal experience, we don't have to lose our faith in the midst of these feelings. Now, some people are living right now, maybe it's you in this service, or maybe it's you that are, that's listening to this service live, maybe you're living in an eroded faith, a faith that has been shaken because of some catastrophic event in your life. My prayer is that this series will speak into your faith at the grassroots, and it will, it will fertilize your faith in the midst of catastrophic events in your life. And so let's just first, uh, let's first uh, ask this question, what should I do when God seems indifferent? What should I do when God seems indifferent? And the takeaway that I'd like you to get from this message, if you don't listen to anything else, get this, because this is what I want you to get out of the entire, uh, of the entire message. You can leave if you want after this statement. All right? And, and it's this. When God seems indifferent to you, it does not mean that He's inactive or absent. When God seems indifferent to you, it does not mean that he's, that he's inactive or that He's absent. And I want to prove this to you by looking at, at the events surrounding one individual in the Bible. His name was John the Baptist. Here's a guy who was considered the forerunner of Christ. He was prophesied as the one who would announce the coming of the Messiah. It was John the Baptist who declared to the Jews that Jesus was the Son of God, the Messiah. And yet something happened in John's life that caused him to begin to question everything that he had declared about Jesus. Here are some words that actually came directly from Jesus about John. Matthew chapter 11. This is what Jesus said about him. He said, uh, beginning in verse 9, he said, What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. And listen to these words. Truly, this is Jesus speaking. Truly, I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen none greater than John the Baptist. Yet the one who is the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. How would you like it if Jesus said that about you? Of, of, of those born among women, there is no, more, no one greater than Tommy Mullins. Of Mark Odom. Of Tommy Sr. There's none greater. How would you like Jesus to say that about you? And yet... What we're going to see that happens to John is that he was surrounded by some circumstances that even caused him to begin to doubt. A little background for you. John the Baptist was not called by that name because he was part of the Baptist denomination. All right? It, it, it was actually, it, more accurately, it is John the Baptizer. That's what he did. God placed him in a supporting role to Jesus' ministry. He preaches a message of repentance, and then he baptized them as a symbol of their repentance. Uh, Jesus and John were actually cousins, if you didn't know that. They were, they were, uh, they were cousins, and, and Jesus loved John. John was the one who... Uh, who Jesus actually asked to baptize him as well. And, and John initially refuses. He says, no, I'm not going to do that. But Jesus insists, and, and God shows up in a very real way, and in a voice from heaven declares that Jesus is the Son of God. Matthew chapter 3, And when Jesus was baptized, immediately, in verse 16 it says, Immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. 
And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. And so John was an eyewitness to this. He was an eyewitness to the fact that God was declaring that this is my Son. This is the Messiah. If anyone had re reason never to doubt, who would it be? It would be John. I mean, if, if somebody said, this is Jesus, a voice from heaven said, this is Jesus, my son, and I'm well pleased in him, I would, be, I would believe that. And so John himself declares this in uh, John chapter 1. Look at what it says. John chapter 1, verse 29. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Who's saying this? John the Baptist is saying this. He's declaring, he's saying, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And look what he says. He said, This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came, baptizing with water, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness. He said this, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and I have borne witness that this is the Son of God. These are the words of John. It's 100% clear here that John knows who Jesus is. Just lock in on three words in verse 30, if you will. This is He. This is He. He's identifying something here. He's identifying Jesus as the one, isn't He? And then something happens to John. This was something that John could, couldn't understand. And it caused his faith to be rocked. The king of the area at that time was named King Herod Agrippa. And Agrippa went to visit his brother Philip. And while he was there, he met uh, his brother's wife, Philip's wife, Herodias. Herod Agrippa ends up having an affair with his brother's wife. And they end up running off together, and Agrippa ends up marrying his brother's wife. And it gets worse. Herodias was also, if you didn't know this, his niece. He married his niece, who was Philip's wife. I mean, even in Alabama, they know that's wrong, right? I mean, <laughs> everyone knows what's going on here. Everyone knows that what's in their surrounding area. They know what's happening. And the word gets to John, and while he's preaching, he says, in the middle of this preaching, what Herod and Herodias has done is wrong. Well, you can imagine how that went over publicly calling out the king of the area. And we read in Mark that it was at the nagging of Herodias that Herod ends up putting John in prison. Interestingly, it appeared that Herod really didn't care a whole lot about what John was saying. But it really bothered Herodias that John was calling them out in public. Mark goes on to tell us that Herodias hated John and wanted to kill him but Herod himself was in awe of John, so he didn't order his death right away. And so John's locked up. He's rotting away in prison. Not exactly where he thought he would be as the messenger of God, right? Not exactly the, where he thought he would be as the one who declared who Jesus is before Israel. It wasn't because he had done anything wrong at all. As a matter of fact, it was because John had obeyed God that he ended up in prison. And when Jesus hears that his cousin John had been put in prison, what would you expect Jesus to do? It's okay to talk. What would you expect Jesus to do when he hears that his cousin John is in prison? 
He's going to go visit him. He's going to get him out, right? That's what we expect Jesus to do. Just you know, go get him. It's your cousin. He's a, he was a, he's a prophet that announced your coming. You, you, he's, he's done everything right, Jesus. Go get him. That's what we expect. What is it in your life that you expect Jesus to do? What is it in your life that you fully expect this is the way Jesus is going to act? This is, the way, this is what He's going to do. So did Jesus go visit Him? Did Jesus even send a care package? Jesus was a terrible preacher, wasn't He? He didn't even go visit somebody in prison when He was put in prison. He, he didn't go. Maybe Jesus would supernaturally intervene. Maybe He would just say some words and the gates would open and John would run out. Maybe, maybe that's what would happen, right? He probably could have. What do you think at this point John is praying in prison? God, would you do something? God, I'm, I'm your preacher, I'm your messenger, and I'm sitting here in this prison. God, would you just do something here? After all, this is John the Baptist. But Jesus didn't go. Jesus didn't respond, didn't initially send a message at all. As a matter of fact, what Jesus did when He heard John was put in prison is He went to Capernaum. That's what Jesus did. And if you were to look at a map, Capernaum is on the north side of a sea. John was way down in a desert place called Machaerus. And so Jesus went to the beach and John is in the desert. And many of us feel that way right now. We feel like that God could care less about our situation. We might feel like that God is probably the, is the furthest away from us that He could possibly be right now. That, that God is just kind of taking it easy, laying by the beach while we're suffering in the prison in Machaerus. John can't understand this. I know because it says in Scripture, we're going to read it in just a minute, he can't understand this, and what, he can't understand what has happened to him. And that often happens us, to us in our desperation as, as well. When God feels distant, it's so easy to kind of lose your faith and lose your, your bearings, or at least begin to feel an erosion of your faith, living in eroded faith. And so what we're going to do now is we're going to go back to Matthew chapter 11 where I began, and kind of look at the interaction between Jesus and some messengers that John sent to Jesus. Matthew chapter 11, look at verse 2. Now when John heard in prison about the deeds of Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, look at this question, Are you the one who is to come? Or should we look for another? We just read what John had said about Jesus, what, G, what John had witnessed in the presence of Jesus. We just read all of that. And the background is that, that John declared, this is he. Remember those three words? We, we know that John had a, a belief in who Jesus was. And, and so John uh, in John 1.30, this is he, it said, behold, the Lamb of God. And so somewhere in the midst of there, from behold the Lamb of God, he moves to what we see in Matthew chapter 11, verse 3, are you the one? Has that ever happened to you? Have you ever been in a place where you said, God, are you really there and do you really care? Are you really God? 
Maybe you're in a season where you're not fully denying Christ, but you're quite cert certainly questioning Him. You're certainly asking, why? Why didn't you intercede? Why, didn't you, why, why don't you act in this way? I think you should act this way. Why aren't you acting in that way, God? Why aren't you acting in this way that, that uh, in my view, is fully loving and fully caring? And Why aren't you visiting me in prison? Why aren't you coming yourself? Here's what happens to John. John begins to doubt. Who's changed here? Is it John or Jesus? John has. Look what Jesus says to John's disciples, uh, that John's disciples should say to him, uh, back to him in Matthew chapter 11, verse 4. And Jesus answered to them and said, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed and, and the deaf hear. And the dead are raised up and the poor have good news preached to them. So what's changed? Jesus is doing what Jesus has done. It's what He's saying here, isn't it? Go tell Him that, that, that these are the things that are happening. This is what you hear and this is what you see. These are the things that's happening. Jesus hasn't changed a lick. But John, circumstances have. And so here's what can happen to the best of us. If it happened to the greatest man, the greatest man born among women, as, as declared by Jesus Himself, certainly it can happen to me, and certainly it can happen to you. When your personal circumstances don't line up with your assumptions about God, it can begin to cause you to doubt. So John's question is a result of his personal circumstances, isn't it? Jesus, you know, I, I, I've told everybody, Jesus, I, I've even preached, I, I've said, I, I've told everybody that Jesus, that you are the one. So I, I've declared that you are the one. Now, Jesus, what about me? I'm sitting here in Machaerus in the desert. You're up there at the beach. And Jesus' response to John kind of just mesmerizes me. Basically, what Jesus says in response to G, uh, John's question is, go back and tell John, yes. That's what he said. Yes. The question was, are you the one? And the answer is, yes. Matthew chapter 11, go tell John what you hear and what you see. So Jesus tell John, tells John to step outside of his personal circumstances and understand what the greater picture is here. And he goes on to describe who the Messiah is, doesn't he? This is who the Messiah is. And so he says the blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them. Listen, don't let your circumstances cloud what you already know to be true. That's what Jesus tells him. Don't let where you find yourself cloud what you have already declared and know to be true. And as John's disciples leave, Jesus has one more statement to make to them. Verse 6 of Matthew chapter 11. Now, this is a statement for you too. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. This is a huge verse in the midst of your circumstances. Jesus here recognizes the inability of man to maintain their faith in the midst of their circumstances when he does not act within their presuppositions. And when he does not fit into the box that we've made for him. How is it that we respond? Do we stumble? Are we offended by the way that he's not acting? 
Blessed is the one who does not allow their circumstances to cloud who Jesus is. And here's something that we can learn from this today. Don't interpret God's faithfulness through your lens of circumstance. Don't determine God's faithfulness through your own personal lens of circumstance. But even as we hear, and maybe as we even understand that, it doesn't help us, does it? That's one of those easy pastor phrases that I was talking about. You know, don't, don't allow your circumstances to cloud God's faithfulness. That's an easy statement to make. It's like you know that intellectually, but what you're going through right now demands God's presence and demands God's action, and you need God in your life right now. God, I need you to show up, and I need you to do something here. Can I just poke around on that just a little bit? Isn't it amazing that we can go through life and completely be, be completely okay with not feeling the presence of God? We can, we can go through our life and be completely okay with not feeling the presence of God. It's happened to every one of us in, you know, in those times when we're having a great time or, or maybe in the, that time when we're pleasing ourselves at a party, on that business trip we're engaging in things and activities that we know that, that God wouldn't want to be present in, so we're completely okay with Him not being present. You know, or that, that trip to Vegas or that time in that bar or that, that time uh, smoking something or taking some drug or pushing something or, or you know, that, that time when you were meeting somebody at a hotel or that time that you were lying to somebody because, and you knew dead, that you were dead wrong, but you were lying anyway. You're completely okay that God is not present in that situation because you know that God wouldn't want to be there anyway. You know going in what's going to happen. And when you get there, you've already made a reservation for the event. You know it's going to happen. You set out to do something on purpose and you know it. And, the la and in those moments, you know, you're not sitting there in prayer saying, Oh God, I just want to feel your presence in this situation right now. You're not doing that. God, I want to feel your activity in my life right now. Uh, you've already made a reservation for the sin. And you know that it's going on. It, you know that it's going to happen. You were driving to get in trouble. You know, trouble is in your back seat on ice. Trouble's waiting for you in that hotel room. Trouble is sitting in the seat next to you or hidden in your car somewhere underneath the seat in the driver's console. Trouble's there and you know it. And you're not saying, let me just tune the radio to a worship station. Isn't it remarkable that when we want to turn off the presence of God, we are completely okay with turning it off. But we get in a situation where we think we need God's presence and we demand that He be here right now. If He chooses to allow us to experience our circumstances, we lose our faith completely because He didn't show up. What I love about this episode in the Bible about John the Baptist is that it's so real in our lives. And it happened to one of the greatest men who ever lived on the earth. And some of you know the rest of the story of John, don't you? It didn't end well for John. It didn't end well for John. John ended up being beheaded. His life was over. And the message that Jesus gives to John is a message that He fully intended for you to hear this morning, for me to hear this morning. You know how I know that? Because Je Jesus said this, 
He didn't say, blessed is John for not losing faith in me, did he? He said, blessed is the one. Blessed is the one, he said. In other words, blessed is anyone, not just John. If you don't lose your way on account of how I act, Jesus says, or how I choose to act, or how I choose to not act, then what He said is you are blessed. And that's where we find ourselves in the middle of this episode this morning, don't we? We need to determine if we're going to be offended by Jesus and the way that He acts. Listen to this today. Your circumstances may never change. Matter of fact, it didn't for John. His circumstances never changed. They got worse. You may never, you may never end your pain while you're here on this earth. It may never end. You may never see healing in your marriage this morning. Your finances may never straighten out. Your job may never be fulfilling as you would like it to be. But what Jesus said is don't allow your view of God to be determined by the lens of your circumstance. God has not, and God will not change. You know, our enemy wants your view of God to be skewed by all of these things. We can begin to believe that, that I'll never be happy again. I'm here and I'll just never be happy again. Or, or there's no purpose to any of this anymore. But nothing good will ever happen to me. We can begin to live in that and dwell in that and stay in that. But I want to give you four statements of truth to replace the lies that Satan puts there. Four statements of truth this morning. One, I can trust God's faithfulness. I can trust God's faithfulness. Two, I can choose happiness in Christ. I can choose happiness in Christ. Number three. Something good is actually going to happen today. Number four. There may be a bigger purpose in my circumstances and in my pain. There may be a bigger purpose to my circumstance and my pain. You know, I know there's a lot of difficulty in the room. There may be a lot of question in the room. God, where are you? Are you here? And do you care? As I stated earlier, I believe the truth is right here in the way that God reveals Himself. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whosoever believes in Him will not perish, will have everlasting life. That's just one of the many truths that you can depend on. God is here. And God does care. Let's pray. Father, I thank You for Your Word. And Lord, I don't know the difficulties that are surrounding the people in this room. And I, I know, though, that You spoke to someone this morning. Because Your Word will never return void. Whether it's somebody in this room or somebody that was listening live, You have spoken to someone. And God, I pray that You would act in their lives... I pray that You would reveal Yourself to them. But God, most of all, I pray that we would give You the independence that is Yours. 
to act in the way that's best suited for us and for, the, for those that are listening. That's not an easy thing to do. Because we come with our assumptions and presuppositions. God, you are God and there's no other like you. Have your way in us today. Be who you are. Act as you act. May we dwell in your love and your mercy. In your name I pray. Amen. This morning you may want to spend some time